There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you worry for a victory win? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power. Wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder work in the blood of the leg. There is power, power, wonder work in the precious blood of the leg. Would you be wider, much wider than snow? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder working power in the blood of the land. There is power, power, wonder working power in the precious blood of the land. Would you do service for Jesus, your King? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Show us, show us 
Oh, oh, oh. 
pulled a little bit of a, some trickery on you. I told you last week, uh, with all intention, that we were done with our sermon series, Next Level. So today is a bonus uh, sermon in that series. I, I had all intentions of going back to the book of Mark uh, and picking things up there, but it seemed like that the more I read, the more God brought me back uh, to this message that I tried to finish up over the last two weeks, and we will finish by God's grace today uh, with that, and I really do mean it, okay? And so go back with me, if you would, to 2 Peter chapter 1, and we're going to finish up uh, this message because we, it's still in the same pericope or the same the thought process of what was happening there. And what, if you'll remember, over the last couple of weeks, we've been talking on the subject to, to grow or to die. In other words, that, that it is designed for us that as we become followers of Christ, we've become born again, if we become Christians, that there is the design that God has for our life that we mature in that process. In other words, that when I'm saved, I ought not be in the same place next year as I was this year, amen? That I ought to be able to go and see some markers in my life. I ought to be able to go and track where I have uh, come from. Now, what's interesting is often, as it is just with children, um, 
We don't always recognize the need for growth. We don't always recognize the need for maturity. As a matter of fact, I can remember as a, as a teenager, we'll, we'll start there, <clears throat> I can remember as a teenager there was times in my life that I thought my parents were the dumbest people on earth. N- nobody else thought that as a teenager? I, I suppose most of us did. My, my kids probably think the same thing. Um, about their mother. <laughs> no, I'm teasing. I'm teasing. I just want to see if you were listening, okay? No, but, they, but what's interesting about this is the older I have gotten, the smarter my dad became. Amen. Now, I don't know that my dad really got all that smarter. I'm sure he has some. But a lot of it is my understanding has matured as I have grown And I can look back on the things that my dad said then that I thought were just so dumb for him to say. And now all of a sudden I look back and I'm saying those same things to my kids. Any of you ever said that as a kid? I'll not do that as a parent. And then you wind up, yeah, amen. So the same can be drawn uh, parallels to our, our Christian life. Whenever I first got saved, I was so... Oh, I was wound up. I mean, I was cranked up tight. I really felt like that if Billy Graham would have given me an afternoon, I would have enlightened him on some things. I, I mean, I was, I, was, I was gung-ho for Jesus, ready to run through a wall. I mean, I was, I was pumped up, man. But I look back on the younger, um, which I'm still very, very, very young. Um, look back on the younger saved Chad. And I wonder how I... I wonder what kept people from killing me. (laughs) I I was at times arrogant. I was at times just haughty and and, uh, uh, at times just just very, very ignorant. But I can now see looking back, and that's often how we have the best sight. You know the old saying of hindsight's 20-20. It means we just look back and and we just see crystal clear. And and, and our growth in Christ, we should see that. The problem is, is we so seldom ever seem to look back. And I think it's important that we look back, to look to see where we, where we came from. Uh, Trey will remember I was his pastor whenever I was a very young guy. I don't know how y'all didn't just run. Y'all were patient. You loved me anyway. That's what he just said. And, and I, I don't know how they did. They give me a lot of grace. So what we're going to look at today, because I want to kind of help you to see some markers have I grown? We talked about the, the need for that and how that comes about. We talked about here in the, the beginning of the passage, uh, uh, we need to appreciate this divine power that's given to us. He goes from there and he talked about in verses 5 down through 7 that there are things that we add now to our faith. It starts with faith, remember, okay? We, we put our faith and trust in Christ, but it doesn't end there. He said add these things, and he gave us things like virtue, knowledge, self-control, perseverance, godliness, brotherly kindness and love. And that's where we ended up last week with love, which is talking about a love for the lost, okay? We have to love the church, but we also are called to love the lost. And that's where we'll pick up today is from there on of what he gives us are the evidences of true spiritual growth. In other words, there is a way that you can know if you're growing. There is a way, biblically, that we can see, am I making progress? Someone asked this question before we read our text. Have you ever wondered that about you? Have you ever wondered, am I... Am I getting anywhere? Anybody besides your pastor? Sometimes I wonder that about myself. Am I growing? Am I getting any better? You, know, you remember that as, a, as a, a child growing up, you're wondering, am I getting taller? Because that's what all little boys, they want to just be tall, right? I don't know why. It's overrated. <laughs> but I remember as a little boy, just, you know, you just, you just want to, you want to always want to be tall as dad. And I still am not there. My dad's still taller than I am, uh, which I think is just, you know, waste. I think you get so, anyway, the, it, it, you get it. But there has to be a way that we can look back and see are we progressing. So if, based on that, stand with me, if you would, to honor the reading of the word. I'm not going to read it all this morning. We're just going to read the portion that we're going to, we're going to dig into. Um, and I really anticipate this will be really quick. Amen. Love me anyway. There we go. So we've made it through that which we add to our faith. We've come now to these evidences, and we'll pick up 
in verse 8. If you found it, say amen. amen. The Bible says, for if these things are yours. Now, these things he's talking about are the things we just referenced, the, the, the knowledge, virtue, self-control, and those things. If these things are yours and abound, he said, you will neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For he who lacks these things is short-sighted even to blindness and has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. Do you catch that part where I talked about that sometimes it's important for us to look back? That's what Peter is referencing here. Some of y'all forgot that you were lost once. Some of y'all forgot the fact that it took the grace of God to pick you up out the pit and put... Anyway, I'm... Therefore, brethren, be even more, don't, don't miss this, be even more diligent to make your call and election sure, for if you do these things, you will never stumble. Man, that got a hold of my heart this week. You will ne anybody looking forward to a life where you will never stumble? I was so challenged this week as I watched with multiplied millions of people the funeral of Billy Graham. One of the things that marked his life that so many just couldn't stop talking about was that he wasn't marred with scandal. He made it to the end. He didn't quit. He, he, didn't, he didn't make it to the end in such a way that he looked back with great regrets. It's what Peter's talking about, that the one and who has not forgotten these things, if he'll do these things, he will never stumble. For so an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly, I love words like that, into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Father, may you bless the reading of your word in Jesus' name, amen and amen. You may be seated. So this morning as we jump in here to our text, we're trying to discover how it is, preacher, can I know that I'm growing? How do I know that I'm making progress? He gives us three, I believe, that are very clear here in the text. Number one, if you're writing notes, write this down. If you're not writing notes, go ahead and start writing notes and write this down with those who are writing notes. Number one, fruitfulness. This is key. If I'm growing and maturing in my faith, if I'm making progress in my faith, the Bible is abundantly clear on the issue, there will be fruitfulness. You see it there in verse 8. For if these things are yours and abound, you will neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. The more we become like Jesus Christ, the more the Spirit can use us in witness and in service. The believer who is not growing is idle. The word there is barren and unfruitful. And here's the truth. We are fruitful when we are faithful. I want you to get that. We are fruitful when we are faithful. Some would say, well, preacher, I just don't know. I don't have a lot of fruit. Well, that's because you're probably not having a lot of faithfulness. The reality of our life becomes that the more we serve him and say yes to him, and we learned this in small group this morning, that we are obedient to him, the more that he produces spiritual fruit into our lives. You see, fruit is not that which we produce. God's the one that produces the fruit. But that fruit comes as we are being faithful and obedient to the commands and the claims of Scripture. Do y'all remember that part long, long time ago where I told you what my mama taught me? Where she said, if somebody talks to you and you don't talk back to them, that's rude. You remember that part? Help you preach it just a little bit. Is that true? We have fruit when we have faith. He produces that. In, it's not something that we just go, mm, there's some spiritual fruit. Mm, there, was some, there was some kindness. Ah, there was some meekness. Ah, there was some patience. Don't you wish it were that simple? 
But it comes, it's the Spirit of God. You thought I was going to bust something up there, didn't you? It's the Spirit of God that produces this in our life when we are doing just simple, obedient acts for Him. My desire is that I not only be growing for growth's sake, but I be growing for effectiveness' sake. I want to be effective in the kingdom of God. I don't want my life to just be about me. I don't want my life even to just be about us. I want my life to be effective as I live, and my life will be effective if my life is faithful. We are effective because we are growing in our Christian experience. So he's just saying here that this this fruitfulness is not necessarily what we have to focus on, but yet rather it's faithfulness, and as we are faithful, he will cause us to be fruitful. He said you will not be lacking that. You'll not be barren. You'll not be the one out here running as hard as you can, serving Christ, saying yes to him, and going, I still have no fruit on my limbs. It doesn't work that way. He produces it always. He is faithful always. Amen, preacher. That's right. Preach that again. I think I will. He is faithful always. Are y'all? I can't do your part and mine both, okay? So, I told you we were going to go quick this morning. That's, that's a third of the sermon right there. Wasn't that good? Number two. Number one was fruitfulness. If I'm growing, there's going to be fruit in my life. I don't have to worry about it. it there's, it's going to be there. Number two, we can also see evidence of growth by vision. In verse 9, he says, For he who lacks these things, the, 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 the fruit, lacks the, the things that he's talking about adding, he who lacks these things is short-sighted even to blindness and is forgotten who is cleansed from his old sins. Vision's important. I read this week, and, and I think it was Wearsby that said that nutritionists tell us that our diet affects our vision. I don't know where John's at. John probably tell us that. John, are you back there? Is that true? Is your, your diet affects your vision. Amen. So if you eat Krispy Kremes, then you're going to see crystal clear. Amen. <laughs> Praise God. Amen. I can see you. But this is certainly true, and I think much more so. Spiritually, uh, that which we take in affects our spiritual vision. The unsaved person, according to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, the unsaved person is in the dark because Satan has blinded them. John chapter 3 and verse 3 reminds us that a person has to be born again for his eyes to be opened to see the kingdom of God and the works. It says, Jesus answered and said unto them, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless a person is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. But then after our eyes are open, it's important that we increase that vision to see that which God wants us to see. And so many of us are just okay that I'm saved. I'm just okay that I'm going to heaven. I'm just okay that I can kind of see. But the reality is, is we are called to increase that vision. The phrase that he uses here in some of your translations that says cannot see afar off is a translated word of of being short-sighted. It's a picture of someone who is closing or squinting their eyes and unable to see at a distance. They can see right here. But right here is all that they can see. But we're called to so much more in our life as a Christ follower to not just see right here because right here is only about me. And if your life is only about me, you are selling yourself short of all that God has designed for you. There are some Christians that have become satisfied with seeing only their church. And this can get really sticky because seeing your church is a good thing. Having concern for your church is a good thing. Matter of fact, I would dare say there's far too few of us that have concern for the local church. But I would also push to say it's not enough to just see our local church. To just have eyes and concern for our local church. Some can only see their denomination. Some can only see their town. Some can only see their state. Some can only see, as you see the progression, their nation. 
But the reality is, the closer I come to Christ, the facts are the, the, the more I spend my time with him and I begin to pour into my life that diet in which he's given me of the word of God, the more I begin to see what he sees and he sees a lost and a dying world that is perishing without Christ. And newsflash to you this morning. He loves the lost no more right here in Tahlequah, Oklahoma, than he does the lost terrorists that may be living somewhere in the Middle East. He loves the lost man, the good old boy in Fort Gibbs in Oklahoma, no more than he loves the lost Sikh in India. Some believers see the needs at home and have no vision whatsoever for a lost world. I read a quote this week of somebody that had asked Philip Brooks, a great preacher, said, what would you do to revive a dead church? To which he replied, I would preach a missionary sermon and take up a collection. Point being that one of the things that spurs us on to growth, that spurs us on to action more than anything, is to begin to see the lost world like Christ sees the lost world. This is why he, he uses this language of saying, some of you have forgotten. You see, if we go back to that time in which we were without Christ, when we were still dead in our trespasses and sin, and reminded it's the grace of God, not my good works, but the grace of God that captured me, that rescued me, that redeemed me. Oh, how could I not have a burden in my heart for the nations of the world that are perishing and will spend an eternity in hell without him? God, break our heart for the nations. And by the way, that doesn't mean we don't give a rip for the guy living across the street. It's a both and. Church, we can't be a church. We can't be a church that puts all our eggs in one basket called Tahlequah or Fort Gibson or Oklahoma. We must be a people that care about those who he cares for, and that's all of them. Where is our mission field? Yes. It's everywhere. It's for those in whom Christ has died. The more we grow in our faith, here's what I've discovered, the larger our mission field becomes. I can prove that in my own life. Growing up in First Baptist Church of Exeter, Missouri, many I'm sure you've visited that place, and it's wonderful. And we were very, very much like the typical Southern Baptist Church. We we used all the same bulletins, you know, that we were supposed to use from Lifeway, and we used the same Sunday school material, and, and, and we did missions, and you said, what'd that look like? Well, we, we wrote checks to these two dead women, one of them at Christmas and one of them at Easter, one of them named Lottie Moon, one of them named Annie Armstrong. That was missions for us. And is that good? Yes, we do that here. It's a good thing. Why? Because our, our monies that we give to those two ladies, we're really not giving to those two ladies, we're giving to honor their legacy because it goes to our missionaries who are serving in dark and difficult places, literally around the world, places that we're not going. So it matters, absolutely. But that was the extent of my heart in regards to the mission field. And so when I got saved, God immediately ignited a passion in my heart to reach my friends and and I began to do that, and everywhere I went, I mean, I, I made a mission. I'm going to tell somebody about Jesus today. Whether they want to hear it or not, I, if they're walking away, I'm going to run out in front of them, and I'm going to talk while they're walking away. And that's just what I did. I found my buddies, and I want to make sure my buddies knew Christ. I became a pastor at age 23. Seems like just a couple of years ago. And I pastored... That church, just like I was raised to pastor the church, and that was, we got to reach these right here, and we did. We made every effort we could to do that, and I still heard of missions, but you, you know how we do this in, in regards to missions. We, we do this in such a way that, well, that's for that big church, because they're the ones with the money. Nobody with money goes to a little church. You need a big church because you've got big money, right? Right? You've never thought those thoughts, just me. So 
We didn't do missions. We, I, and, and there was no need to do that because there's plenty of lost people right here around us. Now, remember, it was about the year 2001, 2002, God began to mature me. He began to grow me. He began to produce fruit in me. And the reason why, my diet was good. I'm not talking about I didn't eat Krispy Kremes. I'm talking about the fact that I was feasting on the Word of God. And the more I did that, the more God began to expand my vision to say that he died for more people than those who resided in McDonald County, than those who reside in Newton or Barry County. That was the, the tri-county area from which my influence existed. So God began to birth in my heart the need for us to do more. And so I went on a horrible, horrible mission trip to the Ukraine. It's, a, it's amazing I ever went on the second one. First one was so bad. It's horrible. It's come ask me privately sometime. I'll tell you about it. It was just terrible. 2004, as this continues to grow in me, not knowing really what to do, I go on my second mission trip to Iraq right during the middle of the war. Go over there and have an unbelievable experience. Come back and something horrific happens. Say, so why are you telling this story? I'm telling this story because this is the journey that God took me on. As I poured into myself the word of God, the more I began to see that I can't just stay home. But yet, interestingly enough, the more I desired to work at home and the more we worked at home, the more we were able to go beyond. And then what happened from there, a church that had never sent a missionary anywhere in the world now became a church who had adopted an unreached people group in mainland China to go from there to a church that now began to get involved in West Africa. In the last year that I served there as pastor of Splitlog Baptist Church in Goodman, Missouri, we sent over 50 missionaries onto the field that year on short-term mission trips. See how that happened? It happened because their pastor grew. What was holding them back? Their pastor was. I wasn't challenging them to go do that whenever I came. Why? I hadn't grown. He said, why do you tell that story? Here's why. I can look back and I can chart the growth. Vision happened. When vision expands, the mission will expand. When, when we feed ourselves a diet of the Word of God and we begin to see the world like Jesus sees the world, we don't just look at it as somebody else's problem anymore. We don't look at it as that thing we'll get to down the road. He develops in us this urgency, I've got to get there with the gospel. The less we grow in our faith, the smaller our mission field becomes. To the point that the only people we're concerned of is us and those who are close nearby. Warren Wearsby said some congregations today are like the church of Laodicea. They're proud, they're rich, they're increased with goods and have need of nothing and don't realize that they are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. See Re Revelation chapter 3 verse 17. All he's illustrating here is this. It's quite possible for us to feel completely successful in the minds of those that would attend our church. And this is fun. And I'm telling you, this is the greatest honor for me every single week is to stand before you and open the Word of God. Please hear that. Irregardless of the crowd size, I could go and preach somewhere to 10,000. And I'm telling you, I'll never be more honored there than I am here to be called your pastor. So it's possible for us to sit in here this morning and say, man, it's a good crowd. Everybody seemed like nobody was cussing. It's pretty good. And all the while, not have a burden to get to the ends of the earth with the gospel. Congregation, if we are to grow as a church, we will grow as we see that vision expanding that we can't stay home. We can't just focus on me, my four, and no more. I pray that God break our heart for the nations. Let me give you the last one. That one took a little longer, didn't it? 
Here's the last one. I think you'll like this one. Security. Evidences that we are growing are the fact that we have this, this increasing uh, vision. We have fruitfulness that he's saying that will abound in our life. But lastly is security. You see it in verses 10 and 11. If you walk around with your eyes closed, you will stumble, plain and simple. But the growing Christian walks with confidence because he knows he is secure in Christ. I don't know of anything in my life that gives me more boldness than to know that I am a child of God. But you let me start doubting my salvation. You let me start doubting as to whether or not I'm saved. You will strip me of my boldness. You will strip me of my ability to make a difference in the name of Christ. You see, it's not, and I want you to clue in here. If, 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 if you need to set up, wake up, lean in. If you need to stand up, if you were in Africa uh, with me, uh, when somebody falls asleep, they'll come tap him on the shoulder and they'll make him stand up uh, while I'm preaching. So if you need to, you stand up, but I'll, don't miss what I'm about to say to you. It's not our profession of faith that guarantees us that we are saved. It is our progression in the faith that gives us assurance that I've been born again. I'm going to say that again. I don't want you to miss that, and I don't want you to misquote me. It is not our profession of faith that gives us security. What is that? Of speaking that, hey, I've been saved. Hey, I prayed a prayer. But rather, it's our progression in the faith that gives us full assurance that God is doing something in me. That God has done a work in me. But for the one that has prayed a prayer and departed straightway thereof, I can tell you why he or she is sitting here going, I don't know if I'm saved. I don't know. There's no fruit. There's no evidence that anything has ever taken place. I'm telling you this morning on the authority of the word of God, anyone, everyone who has been born again, there will be fruit in their life. There will be change. As a weak little clap. The person who claims to be a child of God, but whose character and conduct give no evidence of spiritual growth, is deceiving himself and heading for judgment. Did you catch that? I, I'm fully aware, by the way, I'm in a Baptist church and I'm a Baptist preacher. I get it. I've grown up a Baptist. I was a Baptist nine months before I was born. I was a Baptist 21 years before I was a Christian. I get that. Hey, I thought all we had to do was pray a prayer and get in the tank, man. Well, you were deceived. If you believe that that's all there is. I'm sorry you were deceived. But you won't be this morning. The Bible could not be more crystal clear. On those who have given their life to Christ. Repented of their sin. They are a new creation. They're not just in the church. They're not just in a pew. They're not just writing tithe checks. They are a new creation. Some will be, according to the language here, and this uses the word election, some will be tempted to use their election as an excuse to be lazy or complacent or even unconcerned about their own standing before God. I've been around this my whole life. Oh, he prayed a prayer. And we'll excuse other people. I don't know why we do this. We'll excuse other people, people that we love, people that we care about. Oh, he's fine. He prayed a prayer when he's seven years old. VBS, he's fine. No, no, no need to go share the gospel with him. I, I understand he ain't, been in, he ain't been in the church house in the last 42 years. I get that. But he prayed back when he was seven. God help us. That we not continue to excuse those whom we love straight into the gates and the pits of hell. I feel as though this morning God is pleading through me for your souls. 
I was this guy. I was this guy that we speak of. I, I know that prayer. I prayed that prayer. I know what it is to be baptized multiple times. I mean, I got wet. Yet I would have busted hell wide open had I died. But I'd submit to you today, there's no fake in the real deal. There's no fake in what it is to be born again. That's the language of the New Testament, to be born again. And there's no faking what it is to be growing in the graces of God because it won't look different each time. It will look the same. We will begin to care for those whom Christ died for. Peter, I've got to close. Peter admonishes us in the text to be diligent. The word diligent here means to make every effort. He said to make your calling and your election sure. The Christian who is sure of his election and his calling will never stumble, but will prove by a consistent life that he truly is a child of God. You say he'll never stumble? Are you saying that he'll never make dumb choices? Absolutely not. I'm not saying that. But here's what I am saying. He is not the one that departs from the faith. He is not the one that goes and adopts a lifestyle that is laden with sin. Never to return. I've made some really dumb choices in my life. Probably none of you relate, huh? I have. I've made some just dumb choices. Some that I regretted instantly and some that later, maybe days, maybe even years down the road, God just remind me of, man, that was, that was dumb. Any, anybody relate with you, Pastor? Don't leave me up here by myself. Okay, thank you. And as odd as this may sound, one of the most comforting things in my life was this thing called conviction. Conviction that I messed up. Conviction that that was wrong. Conviction that that wasn't okay. I wonder where that came from. I'm going to tell you where it came from. It came from the Spirit of God who leads us and guides us into all truth. This doesn't mean that this Christian, this born again child of God is always on the mountaintop but it does give this picture that he or she is always climbing higher so let me just let me plead with you one more time don't let a prayer you prayed be the anchor of your salvation I'm not going to go so far as some are today and I think it's tragic that they are that they are being critical of this thing called the sinner's prayer there's some preachers, very well-known preachers, that are. Uh, some have written books on this. The sinner's prayers about. I, I, I'm not not there at all. Because he gives us prayer as a means of communicating with him. Prayer is a beautiful thing, and if we can't pray the sinner's prayer, man, what prayer can we pray? But I think the Bible would come alongside of us and say that the print sinner's prayer is more than just words. It's more than just thoughts but it's really the the action that follows it's the prelude of that which is to come that I am today as I pray this prayer Christ I'm putting my faith and my trust in you I am today repenting meaning today I will sin this way no more meaning today I will and here's the part I think that we miss I will live now for you forevermore Because you see, if, you're, if you've been duped into thinking that salvation's just stopping all that stuff, you're missing the glory of it. The glory of it is that I'm not just living this way, but now I am living His way. And from this day forward, my life is marked by His mission. Don't know that I've ever had more of a burden than I've got this morning. I'll close with this. He talked about in here, because I'm just about to make this another sermon, and I ain't going to do it. I told you I'm closing with it. He said, for 
so an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly in the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The Greeks used a phrase when they talked about an abundance entrance to describe the welcome home party of Olympic winners when they would return home. I thought about that this week when I heard of Miss Karen. Going home to be with the Lord. You know, every believer, every Christ follower is going to make an entrance into heaven. They're going to arrive there and they'll forever be there. But I just believe the more I read my Bible, some are going to have a much more glorious entrance than others. You see, we're not judged according to our sin when we stand before God. We're judged according to our works. And I don't mean judged in the sense that, here again, we're coming back to a sin issue. We're we're judged in the sense that we're rewarded. In 1 Corinthians 3, verse 15 says, If anyone's work is burned, he'll suffer loss, but he himself will be saved. Listen to this. Yet so as through fire. When I first got saved, God reminded me of this truth that I have a choice as to whether or not I would settle for going to heaven or I would embrace a life that would give me an entrance into heaven or I would stand before him with everlasting rewards crowns that I would place at his feet. I want you to know this morning, your pastor don't want to stand there empty-handed before the one that's got holes in his hands. Friend, don't waste your life just going to church. Don't waste your life just going through your life and building your kingdom Don't waste your life just making a name for yourself. I would plead with you. I would beg you to spend your life for the glory of God. Wherever it would be that he would send you. And I would plead with you. Don't you forget where you came from, child of God. Don't you forget what it was to be rescued by grace. Have your sins forgiven. It feels good to be clean, but we can't forget what it was to be filthy. 